Hello, welcome to the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba. Tonight, we're going to pick up where we left off last week concerning Canaanite altars, the Federal Reserve, and spiritual warfare. We'll be talking with Tim Bentz once again, but first, regarding the Federal Reserve, I'd like to play a little clip I found uh, by uh, G. Edward Griffin. He, he wrote a book a while back called The Creature from Jekyll Island, and uh, this clip is from a video. You can actually find this video on YouTube. You can go on YouTube and just search The Creature from Jekyll Island and watch this whole presentation. Uh, but this little clip basically describes how the Federal Reserve was founded and by whom. Jekyll Island is a real island. It's off the coast of Georgia. And it was on that island back in 1910 that the Federal Reserve System was conceived at a highly secret meeting that took place there. And what I'd like to do is talk about this meeting and show you that, in fact, the Federal Reserve was created there and that in, there was a lot of secrecy surrounding it. And then we'll be confronted with the question, why the secrecy? When things are done in secret, there are often things to hide. And we'll explore what it was that they wanted to hide. In 1910, Jekyll Island was privately owned, owned by a small group of millionaires. In those days, they were millionaires. In today's dollars, they would be billionaires from New York. This is where their families went to spend the, the winter months. It was a resort island, a resort club. It was called the Jekyll Island Club. And there was a very elaborate clubhouse there, which was the center of their social activities. This is where the Federal Reserve System was conceived, is in that clubhouse. So let's tell that story. It all began in November of 1910, when Senator Nelson Aldridge sent his private railroad car to the New Jersey Railroad Station, where there it was in readiness for the arrival of himself and six other men who were instructed to come under conditions of great secrecy. For example, they were told to come one at a time, not to be seen together, not to dine together on the night of their departure. If they had arrived at the same time, they were instructed to pretend as though they didn't even know each other. They were to avoid newspaper reporters because these were well-known men and had they been spotted by reporters, which often frequented the railroad station, especially had they been seen together, uh, many questions would have been asked. Even after they got on board the railroad car, this pattern continued. They were told to use first names only, not to use last names. And two of the men adopted code names completely. The reason for that is that they were afraid that the servants on board the train would recognize who they were if they used their last names. And they knew that if word leaked out in that fashion and eventually found its way into the press, the whole purpose of the meeting would have been completely destroyed. So absolute secrecy was essential. Well, the train traveled for two nights and a day on a thousand mile journey to the south and when they awoke on the second morning, the car was on the siding, the railroad siding at Brunswick, Georgia. And from there, they took the ferry boat across the Inland Strait to Jekyll Island and to the clubhouse. And for the next nine days, these men sat around a table and hammered out all the important details of what eventually became the Federal Reserve System. And incidentally, if you visit that clubhouse today, you can walk down to the end of the one corridor there, and on a door is a brass plaque. And it says, in this room, the Federal Reserve System was created. When they were done, they got back on board the train, back to New York, and disappeared. And for quite a few years after that, these men denied that any such meeting ever took place. It wasn't until after the Federal Reserve was firmly established that only then did they begin to talk openly about it. They wrote books on it. One of them wrote a magazine article, and they gave interviews to newspaper reporters. 
And so now, many years later, it's possible for us to go to the public record and find in print detailed uh, descriptions of what happened at that meeting. Well, who were these men? The first one I've already mentioned, the one with the railroad car, Senator Nelson Aldridge, who was the Republican whip in the Senate. He was also chairman of the National Monetary Commission, which was that special committee of Congress which was created for the purpose of proposing legislation which was to reform banking. That was the idea. Banking needed reform. And the American people were greatly concerned in those days over things that were going on in the banking industry. People were losing their money in the banks because they weren't keeping their promises to hold their deposits in reserve. There were runs on the bank and the banks couldn't pay the people back. But most of all, they were concerned over the concentration of financial power that was in the hands of a small group of very powerful and large banks in New York on Wall Street. This is what they called the money trust. That was the name. And it was a very popular expression in the newspapers. And quite a few politicians were elected to office on their campaign promise to break the grip of the money trust. President Wilson was one of those politicians, by the way. So, that was the purpose of the National Monetary Commission, which was to propose legislation, which eventually became the Federal Reserve Act, to break the grip of the money trust over the financial markets of America. Aldrich was a business associate of J.P. Morgan. He was the father-in-law to John D. Rockefeller, Jr., which means, of course, that eventually he became the grandfather of Nelson Rockefeller, our former vice president. You remember his full name was Nelson Aldridge Rockefeller. So he derived his middle name from his famous grandfather. The second person at the meeting was Abraham Piat Andrew, who was Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. He later became a congressman, but he was very prominent in banking circles. Frank Vanderlip was there. He was the president of the National City Bank of New York, which was the largest and the most powerful of all the banks in the country. Representing the financial interests of William Rockefeller and the international investment firm of Kuhn Loeb and Company. Henry Davison was there. He was the senior partner of the J.P. Morgan Company. Charles Norton was present. He was the president of the First National Bank of New York, which was another one of the giants. Also, there was Benjamin Strong, who was the head of J.P. Morgan's Bankers Trust Company. And incidentally, three years later, when the Federal Reserve System was finally created, he became the first head of the system. And finally, there was Paul Warburg, who was probably the most important of all the men there because of his knowledge of banking as it was practiced in Europe. Paul Warburg was born in Germany. He eventually became a naturalized American citizen. He was a partner in Kuhn Loeb and Company. He was a representative of the Rothschild banking dynasty in England and France. And through all the years of his banking in America, he remained uh, in very close contact with his brother, Max Warburg, who was the head of the Warburg <laughs> Banking Consortium in Germany and the Netherlands. Paul Warburg was one of the wealthiest men in the world. Those are the seven men who were on Jekyll Island, and, and as incredible as it may seem, they represented approximately one-fourth of the wealth of the entire world. And these are the men that sat around a table on Jekyll Island and created the Federal Reserve System. When I did my research on this topic, I came to the conclusion that the Federal Reserve System does not need to be audited. It needs to be abolished. <laughs> I came to the conclusion that the Federal Reserve needed to be abolished for seven reasons, actually, and I'd like to read them for you now. First of all, 
It is incapable of accomplishing its stated objectives. Two, it is a cartel operating against the public interest. Three, it is the supreme instrument of usury. Four, it generates our most unfair tax. Five, it encourages war. Six, it destabilizes the economy. And seven, it is an instrument of totalitarianism. It is indeed an instrument of totalitarianism. It has enslaved all of us. Uh, I wanted to give you this little bit of a background there so you, you understand how the Federal Reserve was created and, and by whom, who was involved with it. Mr. G. Edward Griffin talked about seven men representing one quarter of the world's wealth. That's a lot of power in one room. He gives seven reasons why he believes that the Federal Reserve needs to be abolished. Well, after talking with Mr. Tim Bentz last week, I believe Mr. Griffin may have missed a few more reasons why that thing needs to be abolished. Apparently, it was conceived over an ancient altar where babies were sacrificed. If you missed the last show, you will definitely want to go back into the archives and listen to it. Uh, there's a very interesting connection to Nephilim uh, right here in our own country, um, and specifically behind our currency that we now use. So you want to go back and listen to that if you haven't heard it. Now, that last show was actually cut short due to technical uh, difficulties. We had a problem and it just ended. So what I'm going to do is play the last four minutes of that show so that we can all get caught up and remember where we left off, and then I'll bring Tim on to continue from that point on. So let's uh, listen to the last four minutes of the previous show here. This judgment is against the 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 what was started on Jekyll Island. It, it you know if in fact that altar was broken and we choose to believe by faith that that sonic boom <laughs> was indicating that something you couldn't see was broken, and that shortly thereafter the the markets begin to crash. That God is judging the system, but we as a people are gonna we're we're gonna feel that judgment, aren't we? Well, the, the difficulty of these things, because it's dealing with a national issue, is we have to feel the press of that, even if we're on the righteous side of it. It's going to affect all of us somewhat. You know, the market crash, yeah. the bank central. That means you may not be able to borrow anymore. Well, that's really bad if you in depth up your ears and operate that way. Yeah. So we're affected because we're not following in God's ways. But if we will make adjustments, we should be doing everything possible to get out of debt. We should be helping our brothers and sisters get out of debt. You know, we we need to think differently with how we do normal things. Yeah. But even if we let this run its course and, and we survive it personally and prosper through it, still... We've got a piece of money that wouldn't be of any value whatsoever if we didn't attribute value to it. Our dollars are only worth something because they're measured right. against something else. And the problem right. worldwide is every nation today, every nation is operating with fiat currency, and we're the ones that taught them how to do it. So... This judgment is bigger than just the Federal Reserve. It's on a system that God does not like because it's it's dependent on being dead. The change that the Federal Reserve did was not just to change the facial picture on the money. What they did is they took the right that our Constitution gave to the Treasury Department to print the money and set the value there. And they said, let us print it for you and then we'll loan it back to you. Right. Think about the stupidity of that. If, if you just think crazy. wisely, I'm already making something with my own hands, and then somebody else comes to me and says, let me make that for you, and then I'll loan it back to you. you know, that interest. Why would I, why would I do that? You know, <laughs> no. It's mine to start with. I don't need you to print it for me and then charge me interest to have it. 
But that's what we did. We set that up on a national scale. And, and where was the voice of the righteous when that happened? Why was there not a public outcry? It's because we don't understand God very well, and we certainly don't understand his economy. So the reason why it's so grievous and why it, it is a stench in God's nose is because it forces us to have debt or we have no economy. Yeah. You cannot buy anything in this country without a debt being created because if you buy something, that's the reason they print a dollar. So right. You buy a house and you ask for a loan, they print the money so they can give you the loan. That creates debt whether you are borrowing or not. Every sale, every transaction, every exchange has to create a debt now to be done. So that is not necessary, but it is something we chose to allow. Okay, that's where the uh, last broadcast ended. So uh, we were talking about how after uh, God had brought Tim to the Federal Reserve from an uh, undisclosed location in the Middle East where he had dealt with some Canaanite altars out there, and God revealed to him that there was a similar altar underneath the building that the Federal Reserve was, uh, where, where the Federal Reserve was conceived by the men that G. Edward Griffin talked about. And uh, through prayer and spiritual warfare, uh, he described what sounded like a sonic boom, possibly destroying that altar under his feet, uh, underneath the building. And so going with the premise that that altar was indeed destroyed, um, we we're talking about that God is now judging our nation's monetary system. But we use money. So um, let's pick up where we left off there. Tim, are you with me? Are you there? I am. Good to be All back. Right. Yeah, thanks so much for, for coming back, brother. I, I really appreciate it. After that last one cut cut short, I was like, oh, no, we got so much more to talk about. So um, uh, I hope you're ready to go because uh, we all want to sit at your feet and learn from you. Um, let's maybe pick up where we left off there. You're talking about how the monetary system is being destroyed, uh, but w what do we do? Um, we, we, we use money, <laughs> so um, w what's going to happen to us? One of the things that I wanted to reference back to is there's been times in history where this same problem occurred and God had to deal with it to make an adjustment. Uh, one of the major historical aspects of that in Scripture is when Egypt became immensely wealthy uh, from the, the saving uh, wisdom that God gave to Joseph the yeah. nation of Egypt uh, survived the seven year uh, years of plenty and then they and stored up and then they survived the seven years of famine when the rest of the world uh, or the rest of the world that traded with Egypt became indebted to them in order to survive through those famine years. So in one way, Joseph created an amazing system that rescued Egypt in that time of calamity. But in the system that was set up by Egypt during the years of famine, that turned into an enslavement of much of the rest of the world. Everybody that was going hungry ended up selling their fields and selling themselves also in order to have bread. So Egypt became one of the greatest slave nations of the earth in that day. And God's people had been rescued with favor living in the land of Goshen, having the best of the land, enjoying uh, the, the favor of having a relative that was in high government service and was as high as you could get other than Pharaoh himself. And even Joseph's words to his brothers were interesting. Um, when he says to his brothers, I've been made the head of Pharaoh's house, Lord over Egypt, and even a father to Pharaoh. And so yeah. God gave Joseph this extraordinary place. That must have benefited all of his relatives immensely during his whole lifetime and for probably a few years after that. And then we have a little clue that something changed. We have a scripture that says that another pharaoh arose who knew not Joseph. And that little clue is something's about to change drastically. And uh, we got a lot of gray area there. We don't know exactly 
what happened from the scriptural context, but we know that within a pretty short period of time, the Israelites went from having favor and the best of the land and enjoying the wealth of Egypt to being enslaved themselves. Well, you have to ask a question uh, when you read those passages. How did the Israelites become slaves? Uh, yeah. They are, the, they are probably enjoying the wealth of Egypt. They had, uh, You have to consider that if they had relatives in high stations of government, they must have been running some pretty good business enterprises and been in on a lot of the things that became trade and profitable. Suddenly they're slaves. Did they become slaves because of a racial attitude and one day they just showed up at the door and put the ball in chains? That's probably not what happened. And the reason why I say that is because slavery has to first be something you accept or because it is often a judgment, not just a condition that's adverse and imposed upon you. We see nations sometimes being punished, sometimes being brought low, sometimes being raised death in Scripture. That pattern is showing us that God rules in the heavens and the nations have a course and a life that, that he's involved in much more than we realize sometimes. And so for a people group to become enslaved, there's something involved in that. I have to think that probably they were involved in the enslavement of others. And they they may have violated God's rules. And by that I mean if you, if you extract usury from another, if you cheat another person, if you don't release your brother when he comes and asks you for help, if you take his coat in a pledge and, and not give it back to him when it's cold at night, the things that God told Israel, don't do these things to your brothers, don't do these things to one another, uh, be kind to the foreigner, be kind to the uh, to the ones that live among you. Uh, if, if they were ignoring those rules while they were enjoying the favor and the blessings and the prosperous time in Egypt, then that sets up a condition where then all of a sudden someone does that to you. And so I would propose that most of the Israelites who were living in Egypt did not become, uh, they did not wake up one morning with a knock on the door and have chains put on their legs and arms. What they did is they probably got into debt too. And their debt caused them to become slaves before the chains were brought out. And they probably got into debt because they thought they could prosper. So they made investments and borrowed to make them. And pretty soon those when the economy turned and another pharaoh rises up who knew not Joseph and, and suddenly they don't have the favor they had had before, now all of a sudden the debts are called in and they can't pay them. So when, when we try to build our economy on borrowed money, it, it works for a while. You can, you can borrow some money at one interest rate, loan it out at another interest rate, and that works for a while until there's some kind of, of a decline, and then it catches you. And we saw that with the real estate bubble here. So I would propose to you that the Israelites did not become enslaved overnight. They became enslaved by their own choice. Not the chains that they chose, but the debt that they chose. And once they got into debt, the chains were shortly to follow. We've done that as a nation here in America. We have followed exactly the same course. Christians all over this country are in debt, and they did that most of the time by choice. It's just a matter of time before that gets more severe. And while we condemn slavery in history when it was African Americans or when it was some other people group or when it was gross, inhumane treatment of another uh, human being, we don't condemn with the same severity being in debt financially. Yeah, we don't it's the same kind of slavery. That that is, yeah, we don't, even, we don't tell our children that that is just as evil as if you put iron shackles on my legs and feet. And yeah. because we don't have that attitude towards it, but God does, we don't comprehend that we're out of sync with him. We think it's normal, and we think it's a good way to prosper, and we even encourage one another to do it. But when the economy takes a downturn, it catches us all off guard, 
and then suddenly we have a crisis and we can't pay, and then a choice has to be made on a national scale, which is what happened after this uh, event that we talked about in the last show when the economic crisis hit in 2007. A choice had to be made by the nation. So we have elected leaders to help us do that, and our representative government, everyone in Congress, you know, gets together and discovers, the president and Congress discovers that there's a bank crisis. And they're told we have to fix this or it's going to be something like the Great Depression. And so the bailout bill, to bail out the banks that were in trouble, was the equivalent of what Pharaoh did in Egypt when he said, I'm going to make you make bricks without straw. Hmm. What does that phrase mean? In Scripture, we think, well, it means that they're just going to make mud bricks and now they don't get straw. But what happens if you bring that forward and you translate that into our language? It means now you're going to have to build houses without money. Hmm. How do you do it? We don't know how to build a house without a mortgage anymore. We've forgotten how. And the prices of the goods to build a house have gotten so inflated by the system we've created to debt that we can't even build a starter home with cash anymore. It takes people too long to store up enough money to do it. So we have an economy that's out of sync with what we need to do to have a sound start in life. And so for most, the average couple today, it it takes them 15 to 30 years to pay off a house that they started out in as a married couple. And that's just an incredible length of slavery in order to have a little bit of blessing in your life. So I'm looking at this as a judgment, and and a lot of people, you know, argue with me. They they don't like to talk about God as a God of judgment. But I, I want to clarify one thing, that when God judges, it doesn't necessarily mean he's punishing. Right. It, it, judgment means that God made a decision. He's sitting on a throne, he evaluates our condition, and he makes a decision. And his decision is a judgment, meaning that he has decided to act in a certain way that's in accord with his ways. And when he makes a decision, it doesn't matter whether you like it or not or whether you agree with it or not, he's going to carry it out because he's glorifying his purposes and his kingdom and his name, and and we are subject to that. So when he looked down on the depth of the United States and how we had, with this system that we had created, we have enslaved the world also. Mm-hmm. He just made a decision. And his decision was, it's time to set the slaves free. It's time to set my people free. I'm hearing the grumbling and complaining of my people who are struggling under the system that they live in. They can't get ahead anymore. They can't, it's hard to prosper anymore. In a nation of freedom, in a nation that should be the most prosperous nation on earth, my people are in debt and they are slaves. I've got to help them out. And he chose to flip the switch and crash the system. Now, if we had understood God's ways as a 300 million people living in America, we would have got on our knees and thanked him for that economic crisis in 07, and we would have gone to a congressman and said, do not bail out people that have enslaved their grandchildren. Do not bail out ones that are crooked and not doing things right, ones that are taking advantage of the widow and the orphan and the poor. Don't bail them out. Let's figure out a way to bail our country out of this mess that we're in. And we were in a mess. We needed to fix some things. If you added up all the mortgages in the United States in 07, and then you compared it to the bailout bill, we could have bailed out and erased almost every mortgage in this country and had a year of jubilee. Instead, we bailed out a few banks. And we forced on those that had debt uh, the equivalent of a system now that you have to build your houses without straw. You can't get loans anymore. You can't get extensions anymore. If you're behind on your mortgage, you're going to lose it. And we had this foreclosure crisis, 
we've done all kinds of things to try to ease this and alleviate it and step it down a little bit so it doesn't get any worse and, and at the same time manage it so it doesn't turn into a depression. And I, and I would propose to you that it was not a judgment on our country. It was just a judgment on a slave system that God doesn't like. Now, when the bailout bill got passed and we we put this huge new debt on the uh, the, the deficit of all of us, we now have a debt ceiling. We just had this fiscal cliff thing going on. This has still been going on. It's playing out, and it's actually gotten worse. It has to get worse before it gets better because God is crashing the system. What he's trying to get us to do is repent for trying to figure out how to operate against his rules and how to prosper in a way that is contrary to to his ways and how to take care of one another in the process so that we don't just have a selfish response, but we have a response that's good for our children and our children's children also. So think about this as as a problem if we yell at our congressman to don't let us go over the hill, don't let the stock market go to zero, fix this. And and they fixed it by voting for this extraordinary amount of debt to be put on our deficit and bail out the bankers instead of the uh, lenders. You know, so the, the lenders get bailed out, not the ones who have the loans. When that happens, it's the exact opposite of of what we see in the scripture as a year of jubilee. Why was there a year of jubilee designed into God's economy for his people? Why did he have a seven-year period that needed to reset and then a 50-year period where the whole nation resets all debts and inheritance are restored to the families they belong to? That's an extraordinary idea that is proposed in scripture and it actually worked for hundreds of years and made... Israel, one of the wealthiest nations in the earth, when they followed that. But when we tried to gain wealth by mortgages and by debt instead of gaining wealth by just prosperity, and and the difference is if I have to borrow money to prosper, I'm taking an extraordinary risk against the inheritance that should be going to my children's children. But when I prosper slowly, and I build wealth, and every year I gain a little more, and I and I I grow by reproduction. Everything God does, He does by reproduction. So think of a seed. Would it be better to borrow a loaf of bread, or would it be better to have a seed in my hand? Well, if I'm hungry, I I have to have the loaf of bread because I'm hungry, and the seed isn't enough to make me feel satisfied. But if I've got wisdom and I plant the seed, now I end up with a thousand loaves of bread. So if we don't use time in our favor, if we don't make good decisions with a little bit of of things, if we don't make what we have that's little in our hand reproduce, then we sometimes find ourselves in a situation where we feel like we have to go get in debt in order to have something to eat. So the, the church has been as guilty of this Oh, the, the God's people have been just as guilty of these things as the nation has. And God is shaking it up. Now, I would propose to you that if we had gone to God in 07 on a national scale and humbled ourselves and got on our face and sought his face and asked him, what do you want us to do? His answer to us and to our Congress and to our leaders would have been significantly different than what we did. Instead, we tried to come up with our own wisdom to fix our own problem. Well, but and how much say do we really? How much say do we really have, though? Because the, the Fed is, prides itself in saying that we are not federal and the government has no control over us, and it almost seems like it's reverse that the Fed has more control than anybody. And I, I don't really see any evidence of Christians in the Federal Reserve uh, doing, you know. It seems like they're they're dictating to us what's going to happen, not not the other way around. I mean, I I certainly could see us praying and doing all that stuff, but but it's not like our congressmen have any power to do something because the Federal Reserve is above them. Well, that's probably accurate in the sense that their their power of coercion is pretty extraordinary. Uh, money corrupts anybody, 
that is corruptible. And so, you know, a lot of times decisions are not good because somebody is corrupted. But it's still, the biggest problem we have with the Federal Reserve is not the Federal Reserve itself. It's the fact that the American people don't understand it. And the average citizen in our country does not understand fiscal um, matters on the level that it's affecting the nation. So when it's like it's like kindergarten when you're talking about algebra. Now, I only understand how to count to ten, and then somebody starts talking about algebra. I don't know what they're talking about. It doesn't mean I'm stupid. It just means I haven't figured out what's going on on that level yet. And so the average citizen, their brain almost shuts down when you start talking about large dollars. You can throw a number out like a trillion, and people think they know what it means, and they have no idea. You know? They really cannot calculate in their brain how much that is. In, in their mind, it just it's just a lot. And so they don't have a sense that that's, that much more than a billion, but it is, and it's, a, it's an extraordinary amount more. And so when our deficit went from a few hundred billion to two and a half trillion, it just doesn't register. Uh, the average citizen doesn't know what that means. All you have to do is take the deficit that's being purported right now, which are on the books, what they're reporting is far less than what it actually is. And there's some reasons for that which aren't that necessary to go into. You can search out the, that if you want to go talk to the financial experts. But let's just take two and a half trillion. Let's say that it was there and it was not going to go up anymore, and that that was it. That's still an extraordinary amount. Just take the amount of U.S. citizens in the country and divide it into that figure. That tells you that, that tells you how much you owe, and that's how much you owe that you did not agree to. It's your share of that debt. Well, that's horrible when you add that up. You go, gosh, a few years ago I owed 30000 Now I owe about 300000 What happened? You know, why do I have that debt? Now we're passing little rules where it's hard to even leave the country with a bunch of cash because the United States government no longer wants an outflow of cash from our country. We have to pay this thing down. But what people forget is every time the news comes out and says, oh, we're going to go over the fiscal cliff because we've got to raise the death seat and this is the crisis, it's just a bunch of hogwash to make people think that they're fixing it. And, they, and neither one of the parties wanted to take any blame for raising taxes, but they both agreed to raise your taxes and to put more debt on you. And that's what happened just a few weeks ago. But here's the real situation. If we have a deficit, and we do, we have a, a deficit on the Treasury account now that is every taxpayer is obligated to, to the tune of trillions of dollars. Well, who's it a deficit to? If you, if you owe money, who do you owe it to? If I've got well, a loan, I've got, I've got somebody that I owe it to. It's not a, myster it's not a mysterious government account that we all pay our money into. It's... That deficit is an asset on 12 banks' books. And that's what they don't want us to comprehend. So there's a very simple solution, a very, very simple solution to this debt. You erase that debt and you bankrupt those banks. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, we're talking about the individuals that like, are doing this. There, there's, you know, as G. Edward Griffin said, there, these seven guys that started this thing had a quarter of the world's wealth amongst those seven guys. And and after and they, they got the whole world de depended on... Yeah, and they uh, figured out how to get the rest of it. That was... That was that's what I mean. Yeah, got exactly. It. Yeah. And so, so the, the repentance means that we can't probably just go knock on their door and say, you guys are, you know, you, you're nice guys, but you've been, you've messed us around a little bit and we want our money back. They'll laugh at you because... The power to change this, it's not just an evil system. It's a spiritual problem. We have yeah. to have God's help yeah. to fix this. And so we, we have to have a national level of repentance for mm. slavery. And if we yeah. don't repent for our own willingness to enslave our grandchildren, that's the issue that I had to deal with. When I'm standing on that spot and dealing with that altar, 
I was having to deal with my own death and my own heart and my own choices that had been wrong before you have any authority to ask God to deal with something on a national scale. So every person needs to be repenting of these issues in their own life to whatever degree they've done. The other thing I had to look at is I I had a friend when, when 07 happened, one of my friends, that a pretty good investor. She's she's a pretty smart lady. She likes to invest in things, and once in a while she calls me and either asks my advice or tells me what she's doing, and she's a little smarter than I am on some of this stuff. But she called me up and she said, man, I've never seen stocks this cheap. You know, I, I, I've got a little bit of cash that I haven't been in. I've been holding back for a little bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go all in. The market, I think, is at the bottom. And she bought some stock in Citibank, and she bought some stock in Chase Manhattan, and she bought some stock in two or three of the other banks. You know, and um, she she asked me. She said, "You know, this bank has not been this cheap in like over fifty years." And so she goes, "Why don't you Why don't you put some money in there?" I said, "Well, I think you're right. I don't think that bank is going to go out of business. It certainly is cheap compared to their history." Um, it's one of those things that they're in, they're in a problem, but I don't think they're going to go out of business. So I went to the Lord about it. I said, Lord, you know, can I invest some of your money in this? Because it does look like the market's hit bottom. And can we can we find a way to prosper out of this? You know, um, is it okay? Because everything I own belongs to you, Lord. So can I invest some of your money in this bank? And the Lord rebuked me. His rebuke was, son, why would you want to be a slave holder? Yeah. So either you're the slave to the bank, or if you're prospering from that system, you're the slave holder. Right. And we really need another movement like we saw in the Civil War, like we saw in Britain and in America, where men had to finally get to come to grips with the moral issue of slavery, you know. and we must link financial debt with that slave system, that it is an evil system. It is the root of sin. L- Lucifer himself wants to hold your sin over you as a debt that you cannot pay, and even the scripture says it's a debt that you cannot pay, so Christ paid it for us. Hmm. God understands how to release us from debt, we have to first be willing to repent for it and see it as a sin and see it as something that is a grievous thing that we're doing to our children and our children's children. So how do we gonna... how do we stop that on, on our let, let's just bring it down to the you and me individual listener to this program right now. Uh you know, like I've got maybe a year or two left of payments on my car and probably five, six thousand dollars on credit cards. And, you know, probably, you know, a few other things here and there i got to pay off. So, but we're always struggling. I and mean, you're so enslaved to this debt. It's like you barely have any money. You just scrape by and manage to pay your rent um, and then start over again next month. How, how do we, how do we, you know, m- my heart is to get out of debt. How do we do that? <laughs> well, I, I think there's, you know, a lot of good things out there that tell us how to do it in some accelerated scale. There's a lot of guys that's given financial wisdom, um, but the first thing is it's a choice. Is I, what I what I'm purporting is not just that it's wise and prosperous to get out of debt. What I'm saying is we first need to deal with it as a sin. That I need to go to Jesus and repent for putting my household in debt for making that choice. Now, I, I know if you have an emergency or something, then it, it's hard to say that it's always wrong. And there is a few places in Scripture where debt is justified. And here's the only justification. If you have some kind of a calamity or a financial emergency, we're supposed to be able to go to our brother and ask him to loan us something and, and get it without interest. But part of the problem is the church does not see itself as a lender. Right. We have become a borrower. Mm-hmm. So we don't know, we don't love one another enough in the body of Christ to lend to one another without interest. 
instead, and our own families don't always do it. We don't care about our own families that way. And sometimes it's justified because maybe we did do that and then the guy didn't pay us back. So it's hard to, it's hard to give it to him again. But there's a little clue in, in the scripture. It says, do not withhold this from your brother. Do, do not have an evil heart. Because this is the reason that I pour out blessings from heaven. This is what opens the heavens over the nation, and God pours and rains down blessings on his people. There's, it's a heart issue before it's a death issue. So we've got to get our heart right with God over this. And then we've got to ask for his wisdom to get out of the situations that we're in. Right. Even if it doesn't seem like a lot. For me, what I had to wrestle with is I was saying to God, well, my debt's manageable. I'm paying my bills on time, and I, I'm I'm paying it down. I'm I'm getting I'm getting there. You know, it's I'm reducing it a little bit every month, Lord. Well, then suddenly you got a hospital bill that you didn't expect, or the the car motor goes out, and and so right. you you you're working your way there, and then all of a sudden you have an unexpected expense, and you go right back up to where you were. It's like trying to climb up a muddy hill. And so I, I finally said, Lord, what do I do? And he's like, sell all that you have. Give to the poor. Come and follow me. Mm-hmm. God said to me, if your possessions are more important to you than being free, then you don't understand the value of freedom. And so do I need that 32-inch TV? And, and you know, is it really beneficial for me to get rid of it and go buy one of the 60 inches just because the prices came down, but I still got to put it on the credit card to get it? Do I really have to have the leather couch instead of just a comfortable one to sit on? It's like a lot of our choices have been little things along the way. And I'm not, I'm not against having nice things, but I have some pretty nice things. But it's if we choose that instead of getting rid of our debt, then our own choices are bringing us into slavery. Hmm. And so I, I said, I just said to the Lord, it's like, what, what should I sell to get out of debt? You know? um, if you got equity in your house, but you're paying your mortgage on time, would it be wiser to continue to pay the mortgage or to sell the house and take the equity and buy a house that you can pay off? Those were the kinds of decisions that I started reprocessing and running back by the Lord again and just asking for his wisdom. And, and, and I'm not trying to tell any of the listeners that you should do the same thing I did. We all need to hear, hear God on our own individual finances, and he will speak to us on this subject. But everybody needs to be repenting for the issue of death and then asking God for wisdom on how to deliver themselves. But we also need to add one more thing to that. And as we pray for ourselves in our own situation, we should, we should be asking him, Lord, would you enable me to help my brothers and sisters get out of this too? And so I looked at um, a church a little while back. I went to a church in East Texas, and I spoke um, just on reconciliation issues. It was an area that had a lot of Native history and African American history and whites, and that wasn't always a good thing. So we spoke on reconciliation the first night had some pretty cool, um, you know, heart changes that happened, washed a few feet, and the whole crowd really uh, responded well. And the next night, uh, I wasn't sure what the Lord wanted to speak on, so I just said, Lord, this is, this is good. We got two more nights to go. What do you want to do the next night? And the Lord said to me, there's a widow in this church that is the number one giver, and she's in debt. I want her set free. So when I went to the church, I asked who the widow was, and without hardly any coercion, every single person in the building turned and looked at this one little lady named Mildred. And uh, they just, the whole church knew she was the number one giver in the church. So I asked her if I could use her as an example. I said, Lord, you know, said some things to me about you before the service, and would you mind coming up here and and sitting up front and let's let's talk about what's going on in your life, and let me tell you what Jesus said. And turned out she was on a fixed income. She had a very small retirement, and she had just a, a fixed income, and yet she was still the number one giver in the church. 
So I asked, I said, well, do you mind telling us how you manage that? How do you how do you get so much in proportion to your income? She said, well, I just don't have very many bills, so I pay all my bills, and whatever's left over, I just put it in the offering. And it was about 80% of her income went to the offering. Wow. The interesting thing that happened, though, is I said, well, why would the Lord point you out to me? Like, like did something just change? Or what's going on? She said, well, uh, you know, this month I was, uh, you know, I've been giving about seven, eight hundred dollars a month to the church, but she said, um, I can't do that anymore because I uh, needed a new car and uh, praise God, glory, hallelujah, I just got a new car. And, uh, so I, I I can't give as much as I used to. I said, well, if you just got a new car, why did that change your giving? She said, well, because i got to make payments on it. Uh, oh, so you borrowed some money to buy a car. She said, yeah. Well, when she did that, about 12, 13 people started praising God over it. They were, glory, hallelujah, Mildred got a new car, as if that is an answer to prayer. And so I asked them, I said, I don't want to offend anybody, and I don't know the whole situation yet. But I said, why would all of you be excited and worshiping the Lord over your widow friend who has just put herself in slavery. <laughs> and I yeah. said, Mildred, you're African American. Did, do you come from a, a heritage of, of slaves? And she said, yes, sir. And I said, does your granddaddy remember that? Yes, sir. Do you, did you hear the stories as you were growing up of what it was like back there in those days? She said, oh, yes, I did every day. I said, then why would you put yourself back in there? And she looked at me with a stunned look on her face, like, what are you talking about? I said, Melvin, you signed a loan, and you became a slave. Why are we excited about that in the, in the congregation? And so I said, let's, let's take a look at what you've done, and let's see if there was something else we could have done to help you do that better, and maybe we can fix this. So I said, we're going to take a little break, and we were going to have kind of a lunch. And after lunch, we were going to have another session. So I said, while we're taking a break, do you mind going home and getting your loan and coming back here and letting us look at it? When she came back with her papers, she had a 28% loan on a used car. Wow. And it was not just the fact that she was in debt, she had signed something that no son in his right mind would ever let his mother do. Right. And the church was excited about it. You know, and I was just like, what's wrong with this? So we ended up going and meeting with the person that sold to that car and um our attitude might have been a little bit on edge. My, me and the pastor went and got in his office and asked him to, you know, talk to us about this loan. And and he was a little agitated because he said he didn't do anything wrong. And I said, how can you say you didn't do anything wrong? You you put a widow in a 28% loan. And her credit isn't that bad. Uh, she's always paid her bills on time. She has a fixed income. The fact that she's poor doesn't mean she deserves this. And I said, you sold her a nice car. The car's probably a good car to drive. I, I, I looked at it. I think you, you didn't, you didn't, you know, cheat her on the car, but you're cheating her on the loan. Because she'll never pay this off. She'll, the, the car will end up breaking down before she'll have this paid off. And to top it off, the things that she's been doing for the kingdom of God, she can no longer do because she's paying you more interest than she used to give in the time. And so we asked him to change it. We asked him to fix it. And he said, I'm not under any legal obligation to do that. I said, I know that. We're not saying you did something illegal. We're saying you did something morally wrong. Yeah. So I said, what we're going to do is we're going to stand over here in the corner, Charles and I, and we're going to start praying, and we're going to ask Jesus for some wisdom on how to either pro either prosper your business or bankrupt your business. We're going to go ask Jesus for a decision, 
on what he feels like about his widow that has been taken advantage of and whether he wants this business to remain in this city or not. And we're going to ask him to make a decision on whether he wants to continue to bless you or whether he wants to bankrupt you and run you out of town. And I can pretty much tell you what his decision is getting ready to be. Now, that's a little bit harsh. I don't talk like that to very many people. But it was not trying to say we're going to force you out of business. It was saying we're trying to help you make a decision that's in your best interest. You need to be on God's good side. You need to have his heart. You need to prosper and you need to make money, but not at the expense of every widow and orphan and poor person in your city. And if that's how you're prospering, then you're hurting yourself as well as hurting your community. And when we when we helped him understand that, we said, look, this woman has great influence with lots of people in the city. If she goes around and tells all of her friends that you took advantage of her, you're going to lose a lot of business. But if she goes out there and says, you helped her out when she needed something, then you're going to gain a lot of business. And do you want to make all your money off of the widow and get on Jesus' bad side? Or do you want, to make her, you want to make all your money off of her friends because you've got a good reputation, you're doing the right thing? And he repented in front of us with tears. He began to cry, he began to repent. He was like, I shouldn't have done this. I knew I shouldn't have done this. I wouldn't have done this to my own mother. And next thing I know, without asking him to do anything else other than just have the heart of God, you know, he said, please don't pray for God to do anything negative. I, I don't want to be on God's side. I said, we don't want to pray that way. We want to pray for God to bless you. you know? and we're not here to to be mean. We're just here to ask you to do the right thing, just like we would want you to ask us to do the right thing. And we want her to pay her loan off. We don't want her to get into a crisis and not be able to pay. So he ended up reducing her loan to a 7% loan. Uh, he knocked off all the profit on the loan except for um, about $500 on the, on the sale of the car. When we got done in 30 minutes of just having a good conversation with a businessman about the way Jesus does business, we walked out of there with a whole different scenario for the widow. And when she looked at the new papers that she was allowed to sign if she wanted to, I still was grieved that it was still a debt. But the situation went from $480 a month to about 170 That was the difference in the two loans. Yeah. And so when I went back to the church, I said, well, here's what we did. And the guy was very agreeable, and he was very repentant, and, and he even wants to take Mildred out to dinner and ask her forgiveness face-to-face. -face. And he regrets that he did this because he said he wouldn't have done his own mother this way, but he did her. So all of you go down there and thank him for for blessing her and, and don't speak ill of him. You know, The man repented and he asked Jesus to change him. So I said, however, she still has a debt. If she keeps the car, he, he, he gave her an option. If she wants to bring the car back, I'll just take it back with, with you know, no penalties or anything, and I'll, I'll resell it. But she needed a car. So we went back to the church to make a decision. And now the body of Christ is, in that little scenario, is now looking at what would have been an individual person's decision, but now the whole church is meeting and looking at the problem and praying and asking God how to help one of the ones among us. You know. And so I said, everybody that raised your hand and was shouting hallelujah this morning when we were talking about her car, stand up. And 12 people stood up. I said, how many of you would be really stretching it if you um, gave me $50 a month? And they went. Well, that would be hard for me. A couple of them said, I said, if that would be too hard for you to sit down, if that's, if that's something you could do, stay up. So about half of them stayed up. I said, all right, I don't want you to give me $50. What I want you guys that have the means to do is you're going to make the payment for Mildred's car. 
and she's going to make the payment also. And you're going to continue to pay twice what that is worth until you pay it off. You'll have it paid off in a very short time if you'll help her. And the benefit is when she's out of debt, she goes back to being the number one giver in the church. And all of you benefit from that. She's built the building. She's, you know, kept the pastor here. She's she's fed you when you were hungry. You, know, you don't want to lose that. And Jesus doesn't want to lose that in the city. So I said, all of you need to take ownership of her debt because you glory hallelujah her and pray her into it. Now pray her out of it. And I'll do it too. I said, I'll toss in some every month too until this is done. So the church went from being an acceptor of slavery to being abhorring towards it. And, and, and the heart of the place turned and said, we've got to get her free. Well, it just took a few weeks of dealing with that and then a few months where everybody kicked in some to help her out. And then I got called to come back down there again. And when I went down the second time, uh, Charles, the pastor, looked at me and he said, and everybody is encouraged by what you brought us last time. Now we have a question. How can we do it for everyone here? <clears throat> How can we get everybody in this place out of debt? I said, I don't know. Well, let's, let's figure it out. So we started praying and asking God for some wisdom. And I said, why don't we just have everybody bring their bills to the church and put them on the floor and we'll pray over them. Well, while we did that, that's the only answer I had at the moment, but then a couple of guys that had a little wisdom said, you know, we had a building program to pay our debt off when it was the building. Why don't we have a building fund to pay the real building off? And that's the body of Christ. That's every one of us in this room. And those that have the means commit to help those that are in debt get out of it. And that church now is helping one another get out of debt with a, a very simple system. Um, I know of a number of churches now that are doing that and taking this problem seriously. Um, so I think there's a lot of things we could be coming up with um, besides just grumbling and complaining against the Federal Reserve. Uh, why don't we have godly men and women overseeing the financial system of the United States? Why did we allow men that don't have God's heart to ever gain that control? You know, it's one thing to say that's evil. It's another to say, well, what are we going to do about it? You know, if, if we just grumble against what's wrong and we don't propose to the world God's answer, then we're just halfway through the problem. And, and it, the wisdom of God is going to come through his people. We should be telling our congressmen God's answers to these problems instead of crying out to them to fix it with carnal means. And anyway, that's enough of that. The one thing that I wanted to lead us towards uh, before we run out of too much time was just looking at how to pray and how to do warfare in this area. And it starts first with my own repentance. I, I can tell you I could go through hundreds of examples of God dealing with me personally in my heart, helping me see things that were grieving him that were in my own heart, that I have to deal with before he leads me to do the type of thing that we described with the altar. You, you don't gain authority to deal with the kingdom of God things out there in the world if you've not dealt with them first in your own heart. You can't just go bust an altar and change the world if you haven't changed it first in your own heart. So power with God comes first by repentance and getting right with him and learning how to think more like him and be more like him and act more like him. And then when he leads us to do something, on behalf of our city or our nation, his power shows up on a larger scale. And you have the right to go do those things with his guidance 
when you're walking in his ways. Well, I, I can't be the only one doing this. God's raising up all of his kids. The, the, the secret nuclear weapon in the earth is God's children. And he wants every one of his kids to be walking like him, talking like him, acting like him, being like him. And we change the earth one at a time. Like that said, uh, I wanted to let you speak a little bit if you want to, but I also wanted to kind of touch on some things that God showed me about spiritual warfare because a lot of people hear this kind of thing. They hear there's an altar out there. If they happen to find one next month, they're going to go get a sledgehammer out, and I want to really make sure that people understand how to walk in some wisdom with this stuff and not be afraid to deal with it, even on a national scale, but at the same time we need to apply some wisdom to the warfare. So uh, let me talk it back to you for a little bit, Rob, if you have some something you want to comment. I don't want to do all the talking, but I would like to um, share a little bit about conscript <clears throat> warfare. No, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, Actually, why don't you give us a little bit of a, a background on yourself, like how did you get into the ministry yourself, and how did God prepare you for this kind of spiritual warfare, and uh, you know, and then segue into how, you know, we hear what you're saying, we're like, okay, yeah, let's go. But, you know, we don't want to be like the sons of Skiva. You know, my last name is Skiva, <laughs> but I don't want to be like the sons of Skiva, <laughs> go running out naked, you know, uh, having a demon eat me for lunch, you know. Uh, right. So how do we how do we get prepared for that kind of spiritual warfare and, you know, uh, talk about zeal and, and how to temper it with wisdom and that kind of stuff. So, so just go ahead and give a little, little bit of background on yourself first, and then. Uh, now let me back up. Let me back up a little bit then, and and just you know, God has always kind of um, led me uh, very, very personally. I've had a wonderful relationship with Him since I was a child. So uh, the pursuit of God has been my number one goal to, to really know him, to know his face, and to um, learn his ways has been my goal since my youth. But the idea of spiritual warfare, um, I've had a lifelong journey to learn some principles in that, and some of that came from learning some wisdom. Some of it came by just doing it the wrong way. Uh, and by the wrong way, I mean there, there isn't always, that isn't always bad either. Sometimes God just leads us by taking us somewhere, and along the way you learn something. Um, my first understanding of spiritual warfare happened in, when I was uh, in junior high, and uh, we were praying for revival to come to all of our friends and to our school. Me and a few of my other friends were getting together early in the morning before school started and just praying for uh, everyone else in our school. And we began to pray for each child uh, in our school by name. So and during the summer months, we were meeting uh, three or four times a week and praying earnestly for God to give us uh, just um, some wisdom on how to lead our friends to the Lord when school started again. Um, so I'm thinking that I'm going to go to school and be more evangelistic. And uh, God decided to answer that prayer first with spiritual warfare. So I show up first week of school and walking down the hall, as I had done the same year before, often with most of the same kids. Only this time, as I'm walking to class, uh, a young lady that I had known for several years and had always known her to be a pretty nice, you know, pretty nice girl, uh, she looks at me, her face grimaces up, and she starts growling at me. And this very masculine voice comes out of her saying, I hate your guts and, I, and we're going to kill you. And I'm like, what? Like, what is that? And the Holy Spirit said to me, that's a demon, cast it out and then get to class. Don't be late. <laughs> and so I just I just turned around and I said, you know, that's not my, you're not my friend, you're a demon. The Lord says, come out of her in Jesus' name, and she began to cough and, and scream and then ran to the bathroom, threw up, and her countenance totally changed. Peace came on her. She was she was delivered. It was a very simple thing, um, but she came out of the bathroom and felt totally different and was quite 
um, troubled by what had happened, but at the same time felt free. So I said, you feel better? She said, yeah. I said, we got to get to class. We don't want to be late. And we just went on to class. Um, that's a simple thing. But later as I got into more deliverance and praying, um, things that we would consider spiritual warfare and praying on site and, and things, I realized that sometimes I found myself losing that simplicity. You know, that we sometimes make this a lot harder than it is. And it really is just hearing God and obeying him and trusting that his power will accomplish what is necessary. But it's also taking a stand. So instead of ignoring a problem and going on to class, instead of, you know, thinking that girl's crazy and I don't want to be around her and having a bad attitude towards somebody that God loves, it's confronting it face to face and taking a stand and saying, you know, so I, I found the balance of I have to get to class on time, but I'm not going to ignore a demon and allow it to have a free reign in my school. You know? Because it's going to affect my space. It's going to affect my life. It's going to affect my friends. It's going to ruin her life. It's going to ruin her family's life. And, and God sent me here. You're not going to, you can't stay here and me here too. And, but it's not me either. It's saying that Jesus is in this school because he's in me. And if he's here, you, you have no right to be here. So, when she was delivered, I got called into the principal's office before the day was over because he found out about it, and uh, he wanted to know exactly what happened. And, and he was a Sunday school teacher, but he didn't believe that Christians could have demons. Yeah. And I, a lot of people didn't believe that. So this girl was supposedly a good Baptist girl, and, and he knew I was a Christian, and to him it really bothered him that she had a demon. And I looked at him and I said, well, you know, I'm not an expert on this, but I kind of feel like Christians can probably have anything they want. <laughs> and so I said, I don't know how she got it, but she she needs to deal with some things that I'm sure the Lord has showed her. All I know is I'm not going to school with a demon, and neither do you. You don't want that. <laughs> and he's like, well. You know, do we need to call a counselor? He's thinking she's not really demonized. She just maybe she's crazy. We need to call a counselor and send her home. I said, No, look at her. She's just fine. <laughs> she's she's better now than she was this morning. So he sent us back to class, but he was still a little troubled by the fact that that happened at school. And later, I thought, Lord, uh, I hope he doesn't get into trouble over it. Uh, I know she's going to go tell her parents. I know he's going to inform the parents of what happened. So this is going to come up again later. And, and what do I need to say? You know, how do I help her not have any, any trouble relationally with others? And, and how do we do this with anyone else that needs this? And the Lord said to me, no one has taken prayer out of schools. You're still here. And you're still praying. You know, he said, just be bold. You know, do what I tell you. Be respectful of the authorities. But don't back down on issues that need my help and they don't know how to fix them. They need my help. You know, and he said, he encouraged the teachers and the authorities that they need my help. And it's going to get so bad at many of the schools in your country in the years ahead that they're going to be begging for somebody that knows how to fix these problems. And I need my kids to be bold and, and tell the tell the principals, tell the teachers, we've got the answer. It's right here in the Word of God. It's the next time you do a deliverance, it'll be in the classroom in front of everyone else. Don't be afraid. And so it, it, it happened a few months later. I, we had a, a guy that was involved in the occult that he started giving a, a talk about it and doing a, a speech about it and bragging about things that he'd done that was... Pretty, pretty weird and pretty horrible, then the whole class was disturbed by it. And so I just asked, Lord, what do you want to do about that? Jesus, I, I don't think you want to tolerate that. And Lord says, I love him. I want to save him. But he needs to be set free. So I began to pray. When I began to pray in, in my seat in the classroom, he got very disturbed next time. I know he's manifesting in front of everybody. 
he's slithering on the floor a few minutes later, growling and and acting like a snake, and just freaked everybody in the room out. And so, me and two other people that knew the Lord just got up and walked over to him and commanded that to leave, and and the spirit left him, and he came back to his right mind. And everyone witnessed it, and when when that event happened. Half the class ended up getting saved, not not immediately, but within days, because they saw the power of God, and they had not seen it before in the church, and they had not seen it before in the city, they had not seen it before in the marketplace, and they're not seeing it because we're not doing it. We need to be doing this stuff anywhere where it manifests. We need to be understanding that sometimes that person yelling at their wife in Walmart or or well, that kid that's freaking out with his parents and throwing a fit. Sometimes that's not just an attitude problem. Sometimes that's something demonic going on and it needs to be delivered. It's not always the case. We have to discern that and we have to hear God in those cases. But we still should be bold when it is something that God wants to deal with. And evangelism is very easy when people get saved, set free, and delivered. And I found very often Jesus likes to show up and fix a problem and then ask somebody if they'll receive him or not. And so he'll heal them or he'll deliver them and then he'll present himself as somebody they should believe in. And sometimes we try to do that backwards. We try to get them saved and, and, and then hope they'll get better. And we need to not allow a demon to come to church on Sunday morning. We need to allow him not to come into our space any longer. We certainly don't need to be competing with them at the Walmarts. And so, well, you know, I think you hit on something there that uh, a lot of people are not aware of earlier. Um, and this is something that I learned myself at a um, men's retreat. It was all good, godly men there that I knew in in church, and you know, uh, had no reason to question their walk with God. You know, and by all indications, they were good godly believers and then we had this pastor come in and do deliverance and um you know i and then i see some of these good godly guys puking up demons <laughs> and getting and getting delivered uh you know that rocked my world because i i grew up in an environment that taught you know christians can't be possessed but i i've come to disagree with that notion that christians cannot be possessed because we're a three-part being spirit you know mind and body uh, you know, maybe our spirit's okay when, when when the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells us, but you still got your mind and your body left as uh, potential places for them to take up residence. And in in my experience, it seems to have manifested in you know bondage, depression, addiction, uh, health problems, you know, different things like that. Uh, and so, just that alone, realizing that you know what, even we Christians. You know, not just the other guy could have these things too. You know, and that that's re- why we do some of the things we do. That's why we can't get free of some of the things we're stuck in. You know, that uh, yeah. What's the line? The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing man that he didn't exist, or something like that. I think part of it is saying that, well, uh, he, demons can't uh, possess Christians. But from what I've experienced, and from what you just said that would appear to be a lie, that uh, it is possible for for Christians to have some nasties hanging on to them. I think sometimes it's semantics. It's, uh, you know, are they oppressed? Are they possessed? It's like all I know is it's a demon problem. And yeah. if we can get the, demon, get the demons out of the room, then we can figure out the theology on it later. I'm not saying that that's, uh, I don't want to sound unwise either. I, I'm a... A strong believer that we got to listen to the word, follow the word, and stay grounded in the truth of the word of God. But one of the things that got to me on when I was questioning that, because I grew up in a church that did not do deliverance, and, yeah. and you know didn't even hardly believe that demons were relevant today. And I was confronted with it face to face. I had to deal with it because God allowed it to get in my face. You know. Um, but He took me to the passage dealing with Peter, where Jesus said to Peter before the cross, you know, Peter. Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. And that's not necessarily means that Peter got possessed, but there's certainly something there that Jesus was aware that Peter was about to have 
a yeah. demonic problem, you know. And he needed his prayers to be delivered, you know. So, and we see that story play out a little bit where Peter denies him and goes into probably a horrible depression after the cross. And, and I, I, I'm convinced Peter believed that he was not able to be rescued. Yeah, and he didn't even believe resurrection because he didn't feel like he was worthy anymore. You know? Yes. Jesus delivered him with a simple word. He said, go and tell my disciples that I'm alive. And Peter. Yeah, right. He threw a little praise in because he was making sure that the women said to Peter's face, he spoke your name, Peter. He right. called you by name. You know? And what did that voice. do? That, that delivered him of shame. It delivered him of whatever that was that was holding him. You know? Yeah. So Jesus answered his own prayer, you know. And um, when I began to look at that, I, I found that most of the most of the scriptures that deal with demonic activity are releasing the righteous. They're releasing God's people. You know. And yeah, granted, the world has these problems too. But uh, I had to really come to grips with what God's people are letting into their own heart. The next thing the Lord did to me is He took me into um, um, kind of a, a journey that lasted for two or three years where he started dealing with me about gate, uh, a term that I, I teach now that's, that many people understand it somewhat, but it's called gatekeeping. And gatekeeping is a simple term. It just means somebody standing at the door. And whatever you let in, God lets in. Whatever door you shut, he shuts. Whatever door you open, he opens. So think about that authority that he's given to all of us. Mm. If I'm in a city... And God says to me, I've given you authority to open or shut the doors. Well, then how do we do it? And my city doesn't have walls. So how am I standing at the door of my community? Well, with God, everything goes back to the heart. So the door that opens or shuts in your city is attached to your heart. Whatever you allow in your heart, God will allow in your city. Whatever God's people decide to get out of their heart that's displeasing to him, God will deliver their city from those things. When I learned that principle, I was upset about certain places in my city that were crime rate was really high, murder rate was real high. There was one corner in my city that was called Murder Row, and nobody could figure out why people kept getting killed there. It wasn't the worst spot of town, but for some reason... Murders always happened within that square mile. And it was a phenomenon. Police were trying to figure out what was wrong with that area. And then we were looking at uh, places where just all kinds of drug activity seemed to go and nobody could get, nobody got caught. It was always people got away with it. And then we started looking at the, where's the vice, where's the places that are, where evil has a foothold. And I'm praying over my community and I'm praying over some of those areas that needed to be transformed. And God, instead of giving me a word of the Lord to go to the broken area of the city to to preach the gospel and transform it, God started dealing with my heart first. And he took me to this spot where um, 20, 22 people had been murdered. And he said, do you want to know how to fix this? And I said, sure, I'm praying, that's what I'm asking you for. And he said, there's an iniquity on the land here. The iniquity is when someone sheds blood, but then it goes, an injustice gets attached to it. It doesn't get fixed. That's the same principle as what I was describing last show with the altar at Jekyll Island. Babies were sacrificed on it. And even when, you know, French Christians witnessed that. They didn't know how to stop it. They didn't know how to how to win that tribe, so they fled from it, and they went down to San Augustine, Florida, and, and founded a colony down there, and then they got martyred themselves. They became the bloodshed instead of the ones that witnessed it. I don't know how to explain that, except that they didn't deal with it when it was in front of their face, and then they ended up being subject to that. So I, I'm standing on that corner and asking the Lord how to, is there a way we can see the murder rate drop in this neighborhood? 
And the Lord said to me, Sure, all you have to do is command my people to repent for hating their brothers. Because if you hate your brother, you're releasing the spirit of murder in your city. Hmm. And so I went to my father, who was a minister, and I went to other ministers that older than I was, and I gave them that word, and, and I got angry responses, which was odd. Not, not from my dad, but from others. And... I realized that there was an anger problem in the Church of God, especially among leaders, and that anger was often directed towards one another. <laughs> and there was this disconnect of understanding that if I harbor hatred in my heart towards a brother in Christ, I may be opening the door of my city to a spirit of murder. Mm. And I asked the Lord, I said, would you please explain that to me? I, I know I heard you, but how does that work? And he said, well, what you do with restraints was you're not, you might get mad at somebody and you might say in your heart you hate them. But you're going to restrain yourself because you know me. You're not actually going to go kill them but because you release hatred. You know, it releases that spirit in your city and the world that doesn't know me. That will open up the demonic realms of hate. And then they will do it without restraint. And so he said, if you want to see this shut, bring some of the people in your city who know me and have had an issue with someone else that they know that they shouldn't have had and have them repent on this side towards one another. So we did that with about seven or eight people. Just got a little crowd, two or three people that had had an issue, and you know they brought the one they had had a problem with, and, and we forgave one another and reconciled and asked God to forgive us of any hatred towards one another. And then we asked him to release that from others that had the same problem all over town. And the murder weight dropped and has never returned to a significant level on that spot in this city. Just from a handful of believers acting in one accord with our Lord's heart, so I started learning that a remnant has a whole lot of weight with God. That we, It doesn't always take a whole lot. It just takes the right understanding and the right heart. And so it, we got a city of a, close to a million people. It's amazing that God can take seven or eight people who act in one accord with him, and, and he'll transform something that may benefit the whole city. Um, so I started asking for more of that. I said, Lord, I really want to experience that more um, take me deeper and he's like do you really want to go deeper because it means I have to plow up you yeah. and Lord then said something very amazing to me I didn't know how phenomenal it was until a few years later but he said son you have given me your heart with everything you understand you've, you've always responded to me when I've asked something of you but you've not let me go into the places of your heart that you don't know are wicked. The things that you've not done yet, that you will do if you don't deal with them. And he said, will you let me go there? I said, Jesus, I want to be like you. Whatever you got to do to gain me, I want to be like you. So I don't know what to say except yes. You know, do what you must, but gain my whole heart. And I went through hell and high water where God began to deal with me and deal with me and deal with me and deal with me. And he wouldn't let me get away with anything. You know? I mean, I, little things that other people got away with, I didn't get away with anymore. But the standard went up because I asked for holiness and righteousness over my own heart. And it wasn't God punishing me. It was he setting me free. But he began to periodically come to me and say, son, you've got this issue in your heart, and you don't even know what's in there. It's never come out. You've not been tempted in that area. But I know it's there. Here's scriptures that deal with that subject. Begin to pray on those. Begin to meditate on those scriptures. Speak the word over your heart. Confess these things. And I'm like, Lord, I've not done it. If I've not done it, how is it a sin? It's almost like I can't comprehend how that's in me when I can't see it in myself. 
He said, well, you need to let me shine a light on it. And he said, this is what David was doing. King David, when he said to me, show me my transgressions, that my heart will be right with you. you know? So a transgression is like something that you're doing wrong and you don't even know you're doing it. Or it's something that you're going to do wrong just because you don't understand God's ways. You know? When the opportunity comes up, you're not going to make the right decision because you don't have the right foundation for it. And so God began to deal with my heart on that level. What happened is then, every time he would gain something in me, then he would connect it to the community. He said, all right, let me go. Sh- let me show you now where your city's messed up in that same area. And now you can pray for it. Now you can speak to it. Now you have authority in the gate. When you go to people in your city and you begin to address that subject, they'll hear you now because you've dealt with it with me. We have power with God when we become like him and when we use his word correctly, rightly dividing the truth. So I found this gatekeeping principle was profound and not that many people in the body of Christ understood it. So I started talking about it a little more and sometimes preaching about it, and just um, trying to say, I want to comprehend this more. Can we transform the whole city with this? And, and I said, this is how all revivals work. When my people repent of their sins, that's what revival is. When the city that doesn't know me, or the, or the nation that doesn't know me, repents of their ways, that's an awakening. They said, before you get to awakening, I I bring judgment to my house. I bring correction to my own house. If my people who are caught by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. And so I found that we had this really horrible uh, condition in America where lots of God's people were grumbling about the sins and conditions of the, the cities of the nation, but not really fully comprehending the sins that were in themselves that God was displeased with. One big area that I would like to address with this is um, uh, two things which also relate to this um, Jekyll Island stuff. Um, we see this story in Genesis where Abram and Lot have journeyed together and they're in the promised land now. And then we have this passage where it says the Lot's herdsmen and Abraham's herdsmen began quarreling. And when they began quarreling, it was because the Lot's herdsmen were saying, the grass is not green enough over here. The land is not able to contain both of us. And so they were pressing their sheep on the side that belonged to Abraham and his herds. I don't know if they actually had a boundary between them. Uh, I assume that so because they had some understanding of this is Abram's sheep and this is Lot's sheep. But they began quarreling because they were saying, you know, you got too much of the good grass, we need more of that. It's an odd story when you read the context because shortly before that, the word, part of the blessing God had given Abraham was, see the land that's before you, it's big enough, uh, you, you will multiply and, and possess it. And I've given this to you, it, it can contain you. you know. But suddenly Lot's attitude is the land's not big enough for us, it can't hold us, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence and I want that. So the quarrel wasn't really over green grass, the quarrel was over I want more land, I want the land that belongs to you, not just the land that belongs to me. And so when two righteous people start pressing the boundaries and trying to displace one another to gain a little more ground, it starts a quarrel. And that quarrel caused the separation of those two groups. Abram, with wisdom, gave Lot a choice. You take, you take your choice, and if you want to go that way, I'll go this way. If you want to go this way, I'll go that way. He's like, you take first choice, and you can have the best of the land if you want. He just didn't want the quarrel. But what we see in Lot is when he chose the greenest area and he ends up at the gate of Sodom, we assume 
most scholars of the word assume that Sodom was such a wicked city and it was already full of wickedness and that it was judged to a point where God wipes it out. And Lot was, the, there's one scripture says, Lot's righteous soul was vexed from day to day by it. So he's righteous because God called him righteous, but he's not right with God because he's got a quarreling spirit and he's got a boundaries issue. Those two problems set up a scenario that caused a city to be destroyed, a separation between two family members, and then end up with incest in Lot's house. So I would would propose to my brothers and sisters that before it became a sexual problem, it was a boundaries problem. Now, here's one thing the Lord said to me. When I'm looking at all the churches in my city, and we won't work together, and we won't come into unity in one accord, and, and we won't even we won't even come together and pray together over the city. I would propose to you that that's a boundaries problem. It's it's not because we don't all agree on doctrines. It's not because we don't all think that we're valid. It's one pastor over here knows that that church over there is pretty valid. But if they won't get together, if we won't come into one accord. It's because we've got a boundaries problem. We've tried to stake out a spot that we want, and we want to enlarge our spot at the expense of our brothers and sisters. So most churches in my city were trying to enlarge their congregations, and they didn't care what that did to the other congregations. And so if one church grew to four or 5,000, it wasn't always from evangelism. It was most often by taking four or 5,000 from the other churches. That's a boundaries problem. We're not regarding what God has given to our brothers and sisters, and we want more for ourselves. When I've seen that in the city and in the heart of God's people, I can always find the sexual replication of that. You'll find um, all kinds of major sexual problems in a city that has a boundaries problem. If you find history in your city where boundaries were abused. Maybe uh, one group was displaced to take it over, like Oklahoma, you know, took the Indians' land away, and they were supposed to have it till the grass, as long as the grass grew and the, the rivers ro- uh, flowed, and we took it away from them again in order to homestead land for ourselves. If God didn't orchestrate that, then we displaced one group that God had given rest to in order to have something for ourselves, and that's a boundaries problem. When I began looking at that, I realized that almost all sexual sins are the breaking of a boundary before they're the breaking of a sexual law. So pornography is a good example of that. Pornography comes into our homes, and it's violating the the boundary of your home. And often it, it shows up in our computers, and we're not looking for it. It finds its way into us if we don't know how to put safeguards up. And so if it gets a hold on your heart, it causes something to be seen you shouldn't be seen, and it causes the thoughts and intents of your heart to be warped a little bit. And pretty soon it can manifest fully into um, all kinds of other sin. But looking at it from a gatekeeping perspective, if I'm a believer and I'm not dealing with that issue and I'm hiding that and I'm doing it secretly, and I'm, I'm justifying that it's, it's okay, you know. Well, then it releases, it opens the door to that, and it releases that into my community. And it becomes something done without restraint by the rest of the world. <clears throat> and we have to see how often God connects the root issues that grieve him in communities with root issues of the hearts of his own people. And so when I started looking at that aspect, I said, Lord, uh, how do I deal with that? How, how do I deal with, with things? And these were the things that God started looking at in my heart and saying, you've not sinned in this area. You, you don't, you, you've not done this. You've not gone this way. You've strove to be like me. Nevertheless, if you didn't know me, and if you, if you face this temptation somewhere down the road and you don't come to grips with my heart first, then you could 
open up to this. You could open up to these things, and you could become much more wicked than you understand. I've restrained you in many ways by revealing myself to you in your youth. But give me your whole heart. And there's two ways to sin. You can sin when you're tempted and you don't resist it, and then it becomes full-blown. Or you can just have lust in your heart and you don't even know they're there, and they catch you by surprise. So I'm, I'm starting to deal with a lot of my friends saying that it would be better if we would let God have our whole heart and let him plow us up and go after us with intensity so that he deals with our heart before it becomes a temptation, before it becomes something that we might sin in, and taking ownership of the social ills of my community by representing him with the right heart. I went into some of the wicked sexual issues in my city. And I didn't go into those areas of the city and say, I used to be a prostitute and now you need to, you know, listen to the gospel. Or I didn't go to the homosexuals and the lesbians and say, you know, I've had a problem with that but you need to repent because that's wicked. Now, what I did is I, I went in and I said, Lord, if I didn't know you, if you hadn't have saved me in my youth, if you hadn't have transformed me by your blood, I would probably very likely have these issues because the world is wicked and I would have gone the way of the world if I hadn't known you. So if any of that would have been in me, if you hadn't have rescued me, give me grace to repent for it as if I was guilty from it. I've not done those things, but give me grace to repent for it as if I'm the worst most wicked heart of the city. Hear my prayer when I pray on behalf of my city with these issues. And give me your heart for the people that are stuck in those things, that are subject to them and don't know how to be free of them. Help me know how to heal them. When I prayed that, the Lord threw me for a loop because he said, would you really be willing to touch those areas? Yes, sir, I would. He said, all right go down to this address, and he gave me the address of a, of a gay bar in my city. He said, go down there and knock on the door and tell them that you want to wash their feet and that you want to repent to them for the way ministers have treated them. And you want to tell them about my life. He said, don't condone their sin, but you tell them I love them and I can heal them. But you have to have my heart if you'll do that. And the only way you're going to have my heart is if you'll go wash their feet. I don't think that is required of everything that God's asked me to do, but in that one, the Lord had to make me do something extraordinary to gain his, his love and his heart for an issue that I didn't want to deal with. For the prostitute. God started dealing with them, began to deal with my heart about the prostitutes, and there was a couple of areas in the city where they hang out often. And he said, before you go down to those areas and try to get them saved to try to change the area, he said, you need to understand the prostitute is a victim of poverty or a victim of some kind of social need that she has before she becomes a victim to sexual sin. Someone takes advantage of her instead of helping her out. And she offers herself to get gain. It doesn't start with sex. It starts with a need that she can't provide for herself and someone offers her a way to fix it the wrong way. This is the rooted in that spot that says you won't lend to your brothers without interest. You won't help the poor out when they need it. You won't rescue the alien who is traveling through your streets and you just ignore these things. So they end up in prostitution, and then they get condemned because they're prostitutes. He said, so if you want to go down there and try to save them, first go down there and offer them what they were not given the first time. Ask them how they got into prostitution. You'll find they were hungry, or you'll find that they were trying to feed their kid, or you'll find that they were stuck somewhere and didn't know what to do. And instead of somebody rescuing them, someone offered to fix that, for a sexual favor. He said, why won't my people rescue people 
when they're in these kinds of problems without requiring anything of them. Yeah. So I, 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 I started dealing with that one. Um, what I found is that every time, every time I gained God's heart towards a social ill, and he transformed my heart at the same time, then authority to deal with that subject on a larger scale increases. So you gain more and more grace from the Lord to turn the enemy back at the gates when you become more Christ-like. So there's a problem that says zeal without (coughs) wisdom is foolishness. So one thing that I found that a lot of people rush into spiritual warfare because they want to go pick a fight with a demon. And they don't walk in wisdom. And so God always warned his people in Scripture to ask him for strategy before they went out and fought. And he also didn't want them to go pick a fight. He wanted them to fight offensively when he was instructing them. The next big lesson I had was dealing with demonic stuff that was attacking me. Um, I went through about 12 years where I felt like I had no rest from war. It was night and day. I was battling spiritual warfare literally night and day. I, I, I felt like I went to sleep every night with a sword in my hand. I, I, I fought through the night in my dreams sometimes. In the daytime, it was constant. Everywhere I went, it was massive spiritual battles. Every time I, I would show up and... A lot of people hung out with me and thought that was cool. But then after you do it for 10 or 12 years, you go, you know, can I ever take a vacation? Can I ever have a normal day? Is there any rest from the war? And I started asking the Lord, Lord, I know that sometimes we're winning and we're gaining ground, but sometimes I feel like I'm losing or I'm getting hit or I'm getting caught off guard or, or I'm having to defend myself and I'm not hearing you sometimes as clearly as I need to. So there's something wrong with my spiritual warfare. And I said, I've got a demon problem, and it's not necessarily I'm possessed. It's that I'm getting attacked, and I'm getting attacked in ways that I don't understand. I've got some curses that I can see affecting my family. And a curse without cause will not light. So what is the cause? What do I need to repent for? What do I need to fix so that this curse can stop and this warfare can cease? And the Lord said to me a very unusual word. Uh, it's, it's truth, but it seemed odd because I hadn't heard it. I hadn't heard this before, and I hadn't heard anybody ever preach on it. He said to me, "Son, if you have a demon problem attacking you, then you have a father problem with me." I went, "Lord, I don't understand that. I, I thought I had demons attacking me because I'm doing your will. I'm advancing your kingdom." He said, that's a pretty prideful statement. I said, well, I just figured they're attacking me because I've, you know, it's like you become the most important spiritual person on the earth, so the devil himself is coming after you. (laughs) And I'm like, well, I know it sounds prideful even coming out of my mouth. (laughs) What am I doing? He said, you have demons attacking you, and you're, you're having to fight defensively. That means you have an issue with me. So uh, he took me to the scriptures on Balaam. He said, look, Balaam Balaam wanted to go do something I didn't want him to do. And he got a no. But then he asked again. He asked again. I'm like, go ahead. Go do it if you want to. But don't curse my people. He said, it's not that I was saying yes to him. It's that I knew the thoughts and intents of his heart was intent on doing it anyway. So I set him up for a fall. And he ends up with the angel of the Lord sent to buffet him. And the donkey is wiser than he is. When he has this confrontation about to kill him, it's not because he was walking in God's ways. It's not because he was doing God's perfect will. It's because he was trying to exercise spiritual power for his own gain. And therefore he gets, he invites an attack. And the attack is allowed by Father God. And so God said to me, the rules in the demonic realm is, I allow the demonic realms to go, they're like magnets, they're like flies to honey. They go 
to where there's an issue with me. If, you, if you're not right with me, they're drawn to that like a magnet. So if you've got demons attacking you, you it's because you've got something that's not right with me. And you don't always know what it is. It's not necessarily always a sin, but it's something that I'm trying to show you in your heart you need to deal with. So the scripture that says, submit to God, then, comma, resist the devil and he will flee from you. We often forget the submit to God part, and we just think that we got power of the devil, and we just go, you know, rebuke him and curse him and command him to leave, and we forget that we were supposed to submit to God first. So God started requiring me to do it that way. Every time I got attacked, then he said, ignore that. Just turn your back on it. Um, Don't even acknowledge it. Look around and find my face. Get your face back on me. And you should be pursuing me, not pursuing the enemy. And in your pursuit of me, I laugh at my enemies. So when you can see my face and you can deal with whatever I need to deal with in you, then you'll hear my laughter. And when you hear my laughter at my enemies, then you can turn back around and you'll watch them flee from you because they'll see that I'm with you. And so all of my spiritual warfare nearly came to a standstill. And now I'm not talking about territorial things. I'm talking about stuff that was affecting my life personally. And and God, for a season, wouldn't let me deal with anything territorially because he was trying to show me how to keep my own heart right with him. And so I, I started going within. Every time I had some kind of a demonic attack or some kind of a, a curse set up that I could tell something's happening here that's not right, I would go to God and I would say, give me wisdom on this. Show me where something's in my heart. Give me your principles that I'm not understanding. Fix me, you know. And before I would rebuke the demons, before I would start commanding the curse to break or declaring something over the heavens, I would say, fix me. Help me be right with you in every area. And God would point his finger and shine his light on something in my heart that he wanted me to fix or some principle in his word that I was not walking in. And when I would grab a hold of the truth and take uh, either repentance or, or wisdom and apply it, then the demonic stuff would just put it away like the fog. And so I found myself one day waking up and going, wow, I, uh, I don't, I've got rest from the war. And it was this amazing experience because I had not known that kind of rest in, in God for more than 12 years. I had it when I was a child. I started out in my salvation walk with God with a great understanding of just resting and trusting Him. But I had lost that in the pursuit of spiritual warfare. And then God brought me back to that place. And He's like, everything that I do, I do out of this place of rest and peace and power. And so He said, even if there's a storm swirling around you, let me be the eye of the storm. Let find my rest and my peace and move in one accord with me. So when I found that place, then it was like he took a lid off and he said, now let me lead you into the territorial aspects and let me show you the things that are grieving me in your city and in nations. And it has been a phenomenal journey ever since where God has let me do more and more amazing things. You know, and I'm not the only one. There's a lot of people out there that are understanding these things and doing them. But I went into territorial aspects of warfare, like breaking an altar or praying for an iniquity to be released from the land or healing a whole nation. You know. And I'm getting to do more and more of that because I've learned to walk in his ways. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm an expert at that. I don't think we ever stop learning how to be more like Jesus. You know. but I still feel like sometimes I'm in kindergarten school with Christ, but I've learned to walk in more of his ways than I knew a lot a decade or two ago. And so when I came down to the type of thing that I was describing the last show where we broke an altar, I don't go just running out looking for those things. 
and then, you know, I don't carry a sledgehammer in the trunk of my car so I can break every altar that I see. I let God order my steps and lead me. And when he leads me to something like that, then I wait for his instructions as to what to do about it. And all you got to do is do what you see him do and say what you hear him say, and amazing things happen. Well, that's the key right there is is not going off in your own wisdom and strength uh, but first of all, as you said, getting be submitted to God and get things right in your own life, but uh, be sensitive to hearing what he wants you to do. Because uh, I know, like, I got really zealous for uh, healing. Like, I just, I got really passionate about the, the spiritual gift of healing and seeing people physically healed. Um, and I would go out and, you know, think I could just do it anywhere and anywhere, you know, and wasn't seeing anything happening, you know. Uh, it was getting frustrated because I was reading in the scriptures like, well, you know, I'm supposed to do what he did, so I'm going to step out in faith and try to do this stuff, but not seeing, not seeing anything manifest. However, there were a number of occasions where it did manifest, and when I actually went back and analyzed, okay, why did it work over here but didn't work over there? In every case, it was when you hear that still small voice in, in your head or you feel that prompting in your heart or in your spirit, you know, something inside of you is compelling you I want that person healed, you know, and it's not coming from you. It's it's God saying, that person, now is the time I'm going to deliver healing to them. You go. And it, those are the times where, yeah, I, I saw miracles happen. Uh, so, you know, I think from what I'm hearing from you is obviously cleansing ourselves out first, getting right with God ourselves and purging ourselves of everything that's not of him, but then only going where he tells you to go and doing what he tells you to do. Otherwise, you could be walking into a, an, an ambush. Yeah, I think it's um, all, most all warfare in Scripture uh, is offensive when God is instructing his people. Uh, he led them to the land of the promise. He said, to them, um, you, you need to displace these other nations and had some reasons for wanting to do that on his side. So it, I don't think Israel understood those nations or had a sense that they were evil or they didn't, they weren't racial, uh, you know, biased against them. They just obeyed him. God said, I want them out of here. I want, and there's, there's something that has come up before me that's, that's evil in their structure, and I, and I need to deliver the land from them. So drive them out. Don't let any of them remain. You know. And tear down their altars, break down their Asherah poles. It, it wasn't just break their altars. It was drive them out. You know. And so what he was doing was driving out those that would not repent and get right with him. You know. Now, the rules with God is if you will not keep covenant with him as a people, if you will not listen to him when he rebukes you or speaks to you to straighten up, then you lose your land. And it doesn't matter how wonderful the land is or how powerful your armies are or how great your government is. It matters where you repent when he says repent. If you don't, if we break covenant with God as a people, if you do not receive correction from him when you ask for it, then you lose your land. And you begin to be displaced by another nation that will trouble you. Your boundaries get violated because your covenant is broken. So when I started looking at that, that's the pattern in Scripture. When Israel, they gained the land by walking in covenant and experiencing the power of God. They lost the land by breaking covenant and becoming rebellious and idolatrous themselves. And today we're seeing that play out again in our own lifetimes where God gave it back to them. And then they still won't set up the covenant right. They still won't walk fully in that. So it, it's a lot of them over there want that, and a lot of them don't. They just want the land. And so when I was in Israel... The last time I had some Orthodox Jews um, dancing in the streets and, and worshiping the Lord, and I, I loved that, and I began to dance with them and worship with them and just thank God for 
for his people and for the land. And then this one guy um, just started saying over and over, God gave us this land. God gave us this land. God gave us this land. And I stopped him and I said, let me ask you a question. And he said, sure. I said, I said I, I'm really enthused to dance with you and your, your worship is amazing. Thank you for letting me experience this with you. I said, you keep saying God gave you this land. Why are you saying that? He said, I'm declaring it. I'm decreeing it over the land. I'm, I'm shouting it to the heavens. I'm, I'm, I'm thanking God for it. I said, well, do you think God will let you keep the land without himself? And he stopped and stood still and looked at me with a stunned look in his face. He said, what do you mean? I said, do you feel like your nation is, has covenant with the Messiah right now? He said, no, we're waiting for him to return. I said, is everyone in Israel right with God right now? He said, no. I said, then do you want the land without him? And he's like, I never thought of it that way. I said, well, you're, you're shouting a declaration that he gave you something like it's past tense. But what he really gave you was himself. Before there was the land of Israel, there was the covenant of God with a man that knew him. Mm. And so he doesn't want you to value the land and not value him. You can't have the land unless you want him. Yeah. And if you break covenant with him, you'll lose the land. That, that's when God then, because I had that little conversation, I think, he responded pretty well to it. I walked away from that thinking, well, that's kind of interesting, Lord. felt like that was inspired from you, that no covenant with God, no right to the land. Maybe that's true for all of us. Mm-hmm. So I began looking at the state of Israel, and that's when I started realizing that the West Bank had been given away and when they had given away the West Bank, I started looking at the boundaries where these, some of these altars were known to have been. Didn't know if they were still there, but just looking at some of the history and realizing, wow, they have given away the tribe of Judah. And they gave away uh, even the bounded marks that are drawn on the new maps are positioned along places where some of these ancient altars were from the, the Nephilim. And so I, I had learned some of that just from some archaeology that a friend of mine had, had done. But I, I started looking at the West Bank and going, that's really the tribe of Judah. They gave away the mountains of Israel. They gave yeah. away the land that had belonged to the tribe of Judah. And it, it wasn't necessarily exactly that, but it was uh, the, the same area that Judah had been given as an inheritance. Well, what was Judah's problem? You know, Judah's problem before he became a nation or a tribe was this mixture. Sometimes he didn't walk in the ways of his father. Sometimes he didn't uh, know how to keep the covenant. Sometimes he he violated some of the rules. And so he it's just amazing to me how anything we try to mix in with God and then justify it, it cost us something. You know, we don't get away with it. And so when I looked at the West Bank, uh, I thought this is quite extraordinary that the, the mountains of Israel don't belong to Israel anymore. And so I asked God, what are you going to do about that? Why did you let that happen? It seems extraordinarily odd to me that God let Israel come back in the land in 1948 and then they they give half the land away not two decades later. So uh, I asked God, what are you going to do about this? And God said, my plan is going to work out. But before I secure their boundaries, they have to secure themselves with me. So this is not a land problem right now. It's not a Mideast peace problem. It's a covenant problem. Yeah. Where you covenant with God again. And that's true of us. So one thing that I've learned about Israel that I love is God didn't just do something special for Israel and did not intend to do that for all the peoples of Europe. He wanted to use them as the example so the rest of us could learn from that. 
he wanted us to see what it was like when we had covenant with him and when we walked in his ways and he gave us an inheritance. And if every nation of the earth will come to him that same way and ask for that, then he would give himself to them as a covenant and he would secure their boundaries according to his design. Hmm. So I asked the Lord when I, when I heard that from him and I saw Israel as an example and I studied the word on the rules that he set up for governing his covenant and watching over his people and securing their land. I said, Lord, I want to understand this on a global scale. And a few days later, I had an open vision. I was pulled into the heavens, and the Lord sat on the table across from me, and he rolled a map out, and he was smiling with this funny grin on his face, and he's like, you're going to really like this. And when he rolled this map out, it was like a global map. He said, this is my father's design. And he said, these are the nations, tribes, and tongues, the peoples of the earth. And I'm looking at it, I'm going, Lord, I see names here that I recognize, but the boundaries all look different. He said, yeah, this is my father's boundaries. It's based on people's tribes and tongues, not on political boundaries. Uh-huh. He said, this is the way he views the earth, and this is the way he views the people of the earth. And he said... You've, you've grown up valuing your nation's boundaries and valuing your nation's identity, and you still don't comprehend, even within America, my father's design for the people's tribes and tongues that are within those boundaries. And that's when he really opened my heart up to much of the Native American issues, because I saw them as nations instead of as just a conquered people that were supposed to be U.S. citizens now. And they were a distinct people group that God wanted to value that distinction and wanted to do something for them with covenant. And it, and it wasn't an American issue or another nation issue. It was a, a covenant issue with God. He wanted them to covenant with him. And he wanted them to have their own spot in the earth where that covenant was recognized. And so I, I looked at the Palestinians and I was like, Lord, you know, I've, I've been praying about the Middle East and I've been praying about the peace process and, and, and about your people and about Israel. I said, what are you going to do with the Palestinians? And he just said, well, look at this. Here's their boundaries. You know? And he had a spot on the earth marked out for them. And it wasn't the land of Israel. And he's like, I want them to be friends with Israel. I want my people to help them secure what I've given to them. And he said, but they're fighting for something that doesn't belong to them. Yeah, and if my people don't walk in covenant with me, they will lose what does belong to them you know, until they come back into right standing with me. So I, I've learned to walk in that with my own life. I've learned to walk in that. Um, to, I'm sharing that with political leaders sometimes, and, and it's creating some interesting conversations. <clears throat> I'm praying much differently now because when wars break out or you know, national state issues happen. I don't process them quite the same way as I used to. I still love my country. I still value being an American citizen. Um, I believe God has a plan for America. But I just see the earth much differently now because I see God's heart for the people takes great preeminence over his heart for a political system. Yeah. And, and so political systems come and go, but people, if they survive and they continue, God does not let the blessing that comes to them, it endures for a thousand generations, so he knows where that blessing is and where it's going and, and how it's continuing from one generation to the next, and that blessing has transcended many political boundaries over those thousands of years. And so as I looked at it from that perspective, I realized that what God's done in America is quite an extraordinary thing. What he has yet to do is going to be even more extraordinary. But God's people that live in America are going to have to come back into a, a tremendous new depth of revelation about his covenant. And our nation needs to covenant with him again. I think that America has broken covenant with God. 
Oh, yeah, I don't think we want to admit that. I really don't think we want to admit that. Um, I think we pray over it, thinking that we can just vote somebody else in and change that. But I think the heart of America has broken covenant with God. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to deal with that before we fix many of the things that are um, starting to deteriorate in our midst. Yeah. Well, how, how would you uh, how would you wrap this up? What would you say to the listening audience uh, for us to get started and getting on the right path? I think that God's plan always goes back to simplicity. It starts with me. It, it starts with my. It then extends to my family. Then it extends to the body of Christ. Then it extends to the city, and then to the nation. So um, every person listening needs to get on their face and humble themselves and pray and ask God to shine his light on their own heart and say, search me and know me. Show me if there's anything in me that's not right with you. Even if you think you, everything is a-okay with you and Jesus, you need to do it again to give him the right to be the one that justifies you, not yourself. You know? At the same time, don't get under some level of condemnation or shame for things that aren't right. You know, but let God show you something if there is anything. And then renew the covenant with Him, and that simply means He is your King. He is the one that has preeminence over everything in your life. Do that with your family. Make everything right with your own household. If your wife is having tension with you, if one of your kids is struggling and you, you, they're offended or something, fix any offenses in your own house. Come back into one accord with one another and with your king. And then ask him to give you a heart for the city. You know, pray for your city like you never had before. Your city will either get more glorious and holy, or it will get worse, depending on how we pray. And I want a city that my kids can grow up in and play safely in the streets. So pray for your city like you've never prayed before. And be willing to be one of the changers instead of one of the complainers. Go serve your people. Go serve someone else. Love, 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 love till you till you think you can't love anymore. Because love is the only weapon that we have that never fails. And the power of God is released of the love of God. So go love somebody in your city that's unlovable, that nobody else cares about or wants or wants to acknowledge. Find someone that that you have to work at loving and ask God to give you his heart for them. When you become more like him and towards one person, you'll find that the grace of that will spill over in some mysterious way into a blessing for your whole community. And then start praying for the nation. And I really did not have much power with God to pray for America until I had gained a lot of ground in my own household. Sure. I had to ha I had to understand how to be a priest in my own household and pray for my own family and and see my own family saved um sometimes by speaking the gospel and sometimes by repentance on my part but i I looked at that progression that me and Jesus then my family and Jesus then my city or my community, my church community, then my city, and then my nation. And uh, I think that's the pattern of going into all the world and preach the gospel, first in Jerusalem and then in Judea and then Samaria and then in the outermost parts of the earth. And I, I remember that God has always been a family man. And so what good would it do as a minister to go out and try to save the nation if I did not care about my own household? So my wife has become the most important person in my life, other than Jesus. My children are not just 
kids that I love. They, they're my treasure. They're, they're more important to me than anything God does with me. And I put my household above my ministry. I gained a lot of grace and authority with Christ when I made my wife and my children my priority. And I subjected my ministry to my own family. Instead of making them just tag along and do all the things that God wants me to do, I want them to live in God's perfect will. And I had to find that in my household and then let God redesign that in ministry. And so I, I, I laid my ministry down for a little while, not because I didn't want to do it or not because there was a problem or not because I was disobeying, but just because I wanted God to show me how to save my own house. And only a handful of people that I was related to were walking in obedience with him. My wife and I began to just come into agreement and storm the heavens and cry out to God night and day to save our family. And in about an 18-month period, we saw every single person on both sides of our families that we were related to saved and then wow. transformed and then, and then delivered and then healed the things that they needed to heal from. And, and we've got one holdout still. There's one uncle that we have that, that's the last holdout of my family. And, and when he gets saved, I'm going to be able to say that every man, woman, and child that has my bloodline and that has my wife's bloodline knows Jesus because we've prayed and we've gone to them with his love. But to say the gospel to them is one thing. But then you have to prove it when they show up and ask you for help. Or when they don't act very Christ-like, then you have to keep your heart and not alienate them because you think you're better than they are. So you, you get tested in these things. You have to love your own family. And you have to love your city. And you have to love your nation. But it starts first with me and then with my family and then with my community. As I walk that out, it has gotten more and more amazing, the depth and the revelation of that. Sounds real simple, but walking that out is not easy. It's, it's hard to lay your life down for your family. Um, it's hard to put them as a priority when nations are calling. You know? um, I had a cousin that asked me for $700 a while back so he could start a business and I had the money in the bank but it was it was about all I had I, I would have had to clean out my ministry account and and so I, I said well I you know I'd like to help you I could give you a little bit but I don't know if I can give you that much that, that's uh, all the cash I have on hand at the moment and he went away disappointed because I didn't help him and a year later the Lord told me I needed to repent for that. And then he said, if you'll go fix that right, I'll start saving everybody in your house. So he already had the business established. He got the loan at the bank. He had to pay interest on it. And I went to him and asked him forgiveness because I had withheld what I had from my relative from my kin and I had made him a slave when I believed God I've always trusted God to take care of my needs if I had given him the money that I had I know God would have replaced it for me because he's always done that it wasn't a money problem it was a heart problem so I repented to him for that and after that is when most of the members of my household started getting saved like dominoes falling well, you, you don't always know what the issue is. Sometimes it's just a little thing that didn't seem that important. But if Jesus didn't like it, and it wasn't what he would have done, those kinds of things that we repent for may be the transforming thing that changes our whole household or our whole city. That's how revival comes. And so my cousin and I have a pretty good relationship now, and his business has done very well. But he doesn't owe the bank any money anymore. I had to fix that. And so I, when this financial crisis hit, that may seem like a small deal. What's $700? But when a righteous man won't give his own relative $700 without interest, then do I have a right to ask God to bring down the Federal Reserve? <laughs> 
Yeah, right. So I, I, that's the kind of repentance that I, I think we need to really come into a greater understanding of, of whether it's small or great. We have to have God's heart in our, our ways, especially towards those that are righteous and towards those that we're related to. And then if we have God's heart towards the lost, um, they start getting saved real easy when they see the love of God in us towards one another. And the last thing is just to, we need more warriors. We need people that are bold and fearless and will go out and change the world. It's really time for men, real men, to stand up and put their foot down and say, enough of the enemy in the gate and drive him out. But to do that, I have to get him out of me before I can get him out of my city. And so uh, it starts with prayer and repentance and recoveting with God in some area that you might not be walking right in. But once you get that, it's time to go back to the gates of our city and take them back for righteousness sake. You know, and just create a standard that the wicked cannot prosper in. You know, when I started looking at some of the businesses of Oklahoma, I realized that the, God tried to help, tried to get me involved in the issues of banking back in the 1980s, and I just couldn't see it. Um, my attitude back then was. I'm called to be a minister. What do I want to be a banker for? You know? And I was offered in 1984 um, almost every church loan in my city from a, a group of banks. I could have bought those loans at 50 cents on the dollar. I could have delivered the churches of my city from half the debt that they owed on a city scale. And my answer was, well, I'm called to be in missions, and I'm called to be a minister, and I, I don't, I'd have to do that, I'd have to become a banker, and I don't want to be a banker. And later, God rebuked me for that. He said, that was a wicked heart in you. I was giving you, I was giving you power to deliver my churches. And you couldn't see it because you think going out and preaching the gospel is more important than setting your brothers and sisters free from slavery. I had a moment where then when that movie Amazing Grace came out and I I watched that whole thing, I was like, I was, I I realized I had been faced with the same predicament that he was, that he he wanted to go into ministry and God wanted him to go into politics and he had to struggle with that decision because which one could I do the greater good in? And for me, God was saying, I didn't tell you it was an either or thing, I wanted you to do both, you know. But he said, you're called to build my kingdom. And my kingdom means you're going to affect every area of society. So we've got to think differently and not put limits on what God has created us for. I really want the people listening to be encouraged. And I've I've talked a lot about repentance and a lot about sin issues, but don't get under some condemnation and and if you've got shame for anything you've done, it's time to be set free from that. The blood of Jesus has conquered everything that we have already done wrong or that we will do. And it's really time to get bold with him and, and move into covenant with God and understand that you have a relationship with the King of Kings. And there's no better standard on the earth than the position that he has given the simplest of his people. The, the weakest Christian has more power with God in one finger than the, the most powerful people in the earth do without him. If we can just learn to walk in his ways and do what he does and say what he says. So I, I really want people to be encouraged and stand up and be like Jesus. Make it hard for people in your city to tell the difference between you and what Jesus is really like. Let them see him by seeing you. 
And if we act like Jesus and talk like Jesus and are like Jesus, the world's going to change in the next generation without a whole lot of effort. And instead of things getting worse and worse, more wicked and more wicked, which those things, I know there's some things that are going to happen because God said they are, but where are we going to be standing when that's all going on? We have a glorious finished plan. It's already written into the word. It's already been spoken out of God's mouth. We have this wonderful advantage that Father God has stood on his throne with uplifted hand and swore an oath that he would make Jesus' name the greatest name in the heavens and the earth and that he would lift him up above every other name and he would bring the nations to him as his inheritance. Well, if Father God swore that with an oath, how can I help that along? How can I do my part to see that our king gets his inheritance and gets Father's promise fulfilled? So I'm leaning on Father God saying, I want to know how you're going to fulfill that oath. And I want in on it. I love my Lord so much. I want to do anything that you require so he can have what you promised him. So, so show me how to bring my nation to him and lay it at his feet. And give me the nations as my inheritance. The word says that. Ask of him. He will give you the nations as your inheritance. You know what we're supposed to do with them? We give them back to the son because that's father's heart. You know? mm -hmm. So give me a nation, daddy, and I'll lay it down at your son's feet. And I'll, I'll be the one that helps fulfill what you told him you would do. You know? That's my goal, and I'm trying to say to everyone that I know, you can be, you can be in on that too. Nobody is disqualified for that place if you just walk in covenant with God. Wow. So I want, I want world changers to be surrounding the things that God's got me doing. I, I want my friends to go from being ordinary to extraordinary. I want my family to be patriarchs and matriarchs. I want my children to understand that they're queens and their princes growing up in the glory of God, and they're going to be uh, ruling over things that God has called them to do. And the world's not going to affect them. They're going to affect the world. I want the people that govern to learn how God structures government. I want the people in business to learn how to prosper according to his ways. And it's not one person that's going to do all that. It's all of us. But we have, in almost every city, more than enough, more than enough, to just apply this remnant principle where if we just come into one mind and one accord with a handful of people and pray the way Jesus is praying, he'll give us our cities. And we'll turn around and lay them at his feet. And so my goal, and, and I don't think it's a, a lofty goal, I think it's going to happen in my lifetime. I live it and I breathe it and I dream it and I see it and I know God will do it. I'm going to live to see the day where every man, woman, and child in Oklahoma is saved. Mm. I'm going to see the boundaries of my state transformed where 40 nations are recognized because he recognizes them. I'm going to see the Native American nations healed and set free and delivered and become a people like him. And, and it's not just about them, but it's that America will be great again when we understand what God values in our midst. And when we raise up the ones that have been broken, we raise up the ones that have been downtrodden and not had the right things, um, it's going to be amazing to see how that affects the other nations of the world. I want to see every widow and orphan no longer subject to those conditions. How do we release their distress? what good does it do to prosper in my own life and put some money in the bank if I don't care about the widows in my city or if I don't understand the orphans in my midst you know? when President Obama was running for election I was grumbling a little bit 
there's a lot of things I didn't like about um, his candidacy and about some of the issues that he was dealing with. And the Lord said to me, you need to be careful with what you're saying about him, even though he hadn't won yet, because he's fatherless. And I want to put my hand on him. And I, I don't know all the things. I'm not trying to justify him either. There's things I still am concerned about with him. But how we pray for people that end up in authority or end up in some kind of a of a place that can affect our lives. Um, we need his heart, but we won't even pray right. And so I found that I wasn't really praying right. I was praying for the election to change instead of for the man to change. And I think we've got to get God's heart, and then we have to pray what Jesus is praying. So one of the things I, I want to end with is that <clears throat> do do two or three things. If you do these two or three things well, a whole lot will change in life. One is ask God to show you your own heart. I've already covered that. The second is give yourself to your family. Become a leader of your own household. And the third is get close enough to Jesus. Any way that you have to, get close enough to Jesus so you can hear what he's praying and start praying what he's praying. I think God's people have imposed a lot of our own prayers on our master. And we've not gotten close to, enough to him first to hear what he's praying and come into agreement with whatever he's praying. And so when you start hearing Jesus' prayers, you'll find he'll change your heart so you can pray what he's praying the same way he's doing it. And I'm telling you, I, I can't claim that I get every one of my prayers answered. But Jesus does. Jesus gets all of his prayers answered. So when I'm not seeing an answer to prayer, I start leaning on him saying, how are you praying about this? Give me some wisdom on what you're praying. Let me pray that. And every time I've done that and heard that clearly, then it always gets answered really fast. And so um, if every listener would apply that principle right there to everything going on in your own life, where you hear God's wisdom on it and then you pray whatever he's praying, that's how you move into a place of transforming power. And then spiritual warfare comes out of that in an offensive way where you begin to advance the kingdom of God without much effort, and it is a fun, glorious, amazing life set in ahead of you if you'll just walk in his ways and do whatever you see him doing and say whatever you, see, you hear him saying. Well, amen, brother. Can you uh, can you uh, pray us out tonight? Sure. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in the earth. I thank you for your plan. I thank you that you have designed all of creation to be subject to you, and you have made it for our benefit. And you have caused us as your people to know you and to be set free from our sins, our transgressions, and our iniquities. Thank you, oh God, for the blood of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for making his name so great in the heaven and the earth. Thank you for giving us the ability to know him. Now, hear our prayer, oh God. Come into covenant with us again. Everyone that's listening to us, everyone that is going to hear this later, re-covenant with them in every way that you desire. Reveal yourself to them. Show them what they need to do to be pleasing and, and in right standing with you. Let the blood of our Master have power over our hearts and over our lives. Set us free from anything that is not what you want. And I ask you, God, Give us grace to change our families, to change our cities, and to change our nations. Lord, we ask you to tear down the altars and the Asherah poles. We ask you to remove the things that are 
a stench in your nostrils and a blunt to you that are in our midst. Cleanse our land from all iniquity and unrighteousness. We pray for the blood of the innocent not to be shed anymore. We pray for the widows and the orphans to be adopted and married to you and fathered by you. We pray for the poor, which you relieve them from their distress by answering your cry. And I ask you for a revival to come to your people and for an awakening to come to our nation. Lord, I pray for Rob and for his family and for all the listeners and the supporters of his ministry. Would you bless them? Would you cause your word to increase and to to go to the corners of the earth and accomplish your full desire? And we just take this message and this word this whole time, uh, this one and the, the part one that we did, would you release it in a way that transforms lives? Would you get all the glory for it? Lord, I thank you for just being able to know you. I ask you for the reward of the righteous. I ask you for me and for my my friends and for the listeners, would you give us the reward of the righteous? And this is what I pray for our reward. For whatever we've done that was in obedience to you, for the things that we have offered you or laid down, I ask you for this reward. Would you give us more of yourself? Would you enlarge our spirit to contain more of you? Would you give us your wisdom and your power and your glory that we might lift up the name of Jesus and glorify him even more still? And let our nation become his inheritance. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Wow. Tim, thank you so much. You've given us... uh a lot to think about and pray about and um, consider. And how can people get a hold of you? Is there? Do you have a, a website? How can people get a hold of you if they want to? Yeah, I'm actually rebuilding my website right now, but you can uh, find me at Kingdom Compassion International. That's uh, I N T apostrophe L uh, dot org, and um, there's that's a website that is that is uh, mostly about our project in Haiti and some of the missions that we're doing. But uh, you can you can uh, link to me that way. I'm also on Facebook under Timothy Benz. I'm the only one that you'll find in Oklahoma. Uh, there's quite a few Benzes over in Hungary, so don't get me mixed up with anybody <laughs> over there. But uh, I think I'm the only Timothy Benz you'll find in Oklahoma City if you look for me on Facebook. And I, I welcome uh, any contact that way. Um, my personal email, uh, I don't know that I want you to put it on the website, but for those that are listening, I'd be glad to do that just because I know that we'll get questions and and, want, and have people want to contact and stuff. So uh, for your listeners that are listening to the program here, um, you can find me at I-A-M-T-I-M-O-T-H-Y at sbcglobal.net. And then uh, for anyone that <coughs> is um, really wanting to just uh, walk in these things and do more, I, I, I'm a little bit selective with what I do. I don't just go out anywhere anymore, but um, I try to speak and minister and do what the Lord tells me to do, but I don't accept every invitation. I'm pretty reserved with how much I travel anymore. Um but I'm very open to that when people connect right. So I'm, I'm, I'm relational first and ministry second. And so if people are looking for relationship and want to to know some of the things that God's doing in my life, I'm always open about it and willing to share it. So if um, you get any contacts from anybody and they want to connect directly or whatever, I'll try to attend to that if you just forward me things. And, um Facebook is not my favorite way to communicate, so if you send me a friend request, um, please don't just check the friend, and then I don't know who you are. Um, send me a little message and let me know who you are and why you want to connect, and 
Um, I don't check that every day, but I try to check it often enough to attend to it. But I also tell everybody that connects with me on Facebook that I want it to be ministry-related. I don't really care what you had for dinner last week. Um, <laughs> I don't like the fluffy conversation that's on there sometimes that does not build the kingdom of God. And I don't like critical things to be communicated. So I, I look for people that are wanting to talk about Jesus and wanting to make him the priority of their lives. And uh, that's what I want to try to keep the communication in Facebook around. And I think that that's not an easy thing to do because of the way Facebook works. But the more we do that with each other, the more we keep that standard, the more people that don't know him are going to be exposed to his life also. So if you do try to connect with me on that, please try to be respectful of the content. If I accept a friend on Facebook, I want the content to be about Jesus. Hey Amen. Is that uh, live, Timothy or Tim? Is Timothy Bentz on Facebook? Yeah, that's B E N C E. Um, I live in Oklahoma City. If anybody's listening, and uh, I know you're down in Dallas, if anybody's listening and in our area, I'd be very happy to connect with people that are nearby. So. All right. Well, thanks again so much for coming on and doing part two with us. Uh, you no, know, it, it it ended too quick last time, so I was really happy to hear that you were available to come on again tonight. So thank you very much. Well, this was good. I appreciate the opportunity. Look forward to any of the feedback that we get. Okay, brother. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. You too. And that's all we have time for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you heard uh, his contact information. I'll give it to you again. It's Timothy Bentz on Facebook. He lives in Oklahoma City. And his email is I am Timothy at sbcglobal.net. And his website is Kingdom Compassion International, and that's kingdomcompassionintl.org if you want to get a hold of him. All right. That's all we have time for tonight, so we'll see you back uh, here for Virtual House Church this Friday night from uh, 8 p.m. till 10 p.m. Central Standard Time. Good night, everybody. At Thomas Cook Airlines, we're feeling pretty excited about our big Cape Town sale. So we asked a local to tell you what you can look forward to. Keep it right down. We don't want to startle them. You see over there? Awesome, huh? And, oh, check him out over there. Incredible. And look, isn't it wild? <laughs> Fly direct from London Gatwick to Cape Town this winter from only £549.99 return. Prices aircrafted for you at thomascookairlines.com. Selected dates, limited availability, terms, conditions, credit card for your fly.